The Nissan Leaf 2, Australia's most affordable EV. Who's it for? How far can it go? How do you charge it? My name's Chris, and I'm gonna answer that in this Australian Review. Welcome everyone. The Nissan Leaf 2 has been available in Australia for only a very short time, and I've been fortunate enough to get this on loan from Nissan Electric for a week. And I'm gonna be doing a few things with it. I'll be doing the school drop-off, going to work, doing the shopping, doing a few long drives. And I'm gonna test out this car to see just how good it is at actually, well, being a daily commuter. Something that a lot of people will be using this car for. But let's start about the look, shall we? That front end, I like it. Nice aggressive looking lines. The side profile, very attractive. Love it. The high roof gives a lot of space in the interior. And then going to the boot, the bum, it's, it's okay. Overall, people have already asked me, what is that? And they're like, that looks pretty nice. And I, I had to agree with them. Charging the Nissan Leaf 2 can be done with either a Mode 2 or Mode 3 cable, which will either see it being recharged in, well, 24 hours or seven and a half hours. But know that the average Australian only commutes about 38 kilometers per day. So that seven and a half hours is very realistic. Conversely, you can go to any DC fast charger up to 50 kilowatts and have this thing charged to 80% in less than 45 minutes. Inside the Nissan Leaf interior, it's actually pretty nice. There's like a mixture of different uh, materials. You've got some leather, uh, leather steering wheel, leather sides, but then you've also got some very hard plastics like here and up here on the dash. So it's a little unfortunate that in all, it's, it, it comes across as being looking nice and it is nice, but I think over time, some of these hard plastics won't do well with the Australian sun. The steering wheel is leather wrapped and is heated. The seat, also leather, with a little bit of suede. And they're a manual affair, so they're six way adjustable, so forward and back, up and down, as well as the uh, incline. But unfortunately, there's no tilt and nor is there any lumbar support. The interior of the car is actually quite spacious. This seating position is set to mine, and I'm only five foot 10. So I've got about, well, that much from my head, and well, plenty of leg room, as well as foot room. So I'm fortunate they've actually got like a center little uh, thing down the middle. It will comfortably seat four people, can seat five, but across the rear, shoulder room will be a bit tight and a bit squishy. Yeah, the Isofix uh, seating system, and the kids have found it very enjoyable back here, especially these nice leather seats. One of my criticisms of the Leaf is that the switch gear is a mixed bag. There's some really good stuff, especially up top here. But when you come down to the lower part of the console, you've got some very cheap, nasty looking switches. And these leather seats, they're heated, as well as the rear, which is very nice. But they're, they're old fashioned rocker switches, which don't seem to actually belong to this interior. It's a very weird decision. I, I imagine it was like someone in the factory thought one day, hey, we run out of those nice switches. Let's just put these ones in. Why? I don't know why. To get your Nissan Leaf going, all you simply do is use this little drive selector. It is a funky looking thing. It looks a bit reminiscent of a mix between a mushroom and a hockey puck. All you simply do, if you push it to the right, you're gonna put it into neutral. If you push it down towards you, just like a normal automatic, it goes into drive. If you put it towards the front, it goes into reverse and engages the rear view camera. Now, this rear view camera is, well, oh gosh. Resolution, 
I think only about 640 lines. For those playing along at home, <laughs> that resolution is very much old school. It's hard to see clearly what your surroundings are. You, you, you do get a good idea, especially with what I call the God view. There's actually four cameras around the car. There's two under the side mirrors, one at the very front, and of course the reversing camera. That God view, what it does is it stitches together all those four images. So you get a very good idea as to where you are parking, say, especially when you've got those tight situations, or maybe you're just not very certain about if you're gonna hit the curb. Yeah, no one likes hitting the curb, do they? No. The Nissan Leaf has no less than three different drive modes. When you first get it, it'll be in the bog standard version, and that is with moderate regen. So you use the accelerators, go fast, you push the brake to slow down, the usual sort of stuff. But if you really want to make the most out of that battery, there's two other modes. One's e-pedal and one's eco. So with eco, that basically is going to limit the amount of acceleration you have, temper down some of your climate control settings, and well, gives you the most bang for the buck in terms of battery economy. But the real mode here, which I think all car manufacturers should do, is e-pedal. Now, e-pedal is awesome. You have to enable it just by hitting this little switch down here, or, and I'll tell you about this later on, you go through the settings to permanently turn it on every time you turn the car on. And what this now means is that it's like driving a dodging car. Your accelerator becomes also the brake. As I take my foot off the accelerator, it is slowing the car down using regen, but it's also gonna break the car right at the very end. Now, I know that all EVs do this, but not to this level. For the Kona EV, for example, you have to use the paddles to come to get to a complete stop. Teslas, you have to actually uh, put the brake on at the very last moment, and then it will engage, hold, and you can take a foot off. This, on the other hand, is a complete, true one pedal experience and it makes driving so much more effortless and enjoyable. It only took me like one day to get used to it. And it, it's, it's amazing. A little bit challenging when you're parking the car and at first I found myself turning it off because you just don't have the confidence in yourself. Will I maybe over accelerate this or not? It does have obstacle avoidance mode. And that is to say, if it thinks you're gonna hit something, it will slam on the brakes. But after, oh, I think, day four, I was confidently parking this car with that average camera system and sensors. And uh, yeah, I haven't looked back. Driving the Nissan Leaf is pleasant. It accelerates to 100 k's per hour in 7.9 seconds from that 110 kilowatt motor. But the real game here is that it's got a 320 newton meters of torque to actually get you up fast, super fast. Friends who have been in it have suggested that their cars actually maybe have a higher uh, torque number, but because of that instant acceleration, you know, in an EV, you do not have to wait for the power to be in the right band, as well as what well, you being the right gear or your car being the right gear. This car just goes quickly and it feels rapid. So right now I'm doing 30 k's per hour and I'll put my foot down on the happy pedal and instantly 60 plus <coughs> cough. It was only 60 officer, it was only 60. That bump right there was a good example of how this car is okay for our Australian roads. I think they've gone for a bit of a softer setting given that our roads are very mediocre. But I feel that they actually should have maybe gone a bit stiffer because it just seems to be a little wishy-washy. So as I'm driving along here, I'm getting just a little bit of 
nerves, like a little bit of movement that you shouldn't expect from just, well, this, this okay type of road. If they had maybe firmed the suspension a bit better, going through corners, either slow or fast, would be a lot more enjoyable experience because there is a little bit of body roll and couple that with this seat that doesn't actually really hug you. It's not a, it's not a bucket seat in any way, shape or form. Just by doing those few things, dampeners, stiffer springs, a better seat, I feel that the ride on this car will be a lot more enjoyable. Speaking of seating comfort, people who are tall I think might have a problem with this car. Sure, the seat moves back far enough and you won't have an issue with the pedals, but you will have an issue with this steering wheel. It only has tilt, it doesn't have telescopic in or out. And well, that's a problem because why on earth any car in this day and age in 2019 doesn't have that as a standard feature? I mean, come on, even the cheapest cars that I know have that as standard these days. I think it's unforgivable. Another minor complaint I have with this interior is this elbow rest. It, it, it doesn't sit in the right place. I think if I was taller and my seat was further back, it would be supportive and it would work. But for my short frame, my elbow just keeps falling off it and it provides no support whatsoever. Plus also, it's tiny in there. So it's kind of like either make it bigger, get rid of one of the cup holders or just, just don't. There's an, just one more thing I don't like, and that is the mix of where your settings happen. Some of the information occurs in this uh, display right in front of you in the pinnacle area. And sure, you've got usual status stuff. So you've got a very analog speed dial. That's very old school, but whatever, I don't mind. Um, then you've got a digital area. And here it gives you status information, what your state of charge is, how you're driving, uh, what your expected range is, uh, EV type of stuff. And the nerd of me that loves that, I love all those sort of numbers, but they've burrowed into there a whole menu tree of settings. And then also in the AV head unit, there's also other settings. And well, it just feels weird because having to use the up, down, left, right pad to get to whatever function it might be. And some of them are buried deep. Like I said earlier with the E pedal, that thing was really hard to find and I had to get the manual out to do it. It wasn't intuitive whatsoever. So I think Nissan Electric needs to decide where they're gonna put settings and it just makes sense that that touchscreen interface is better suited to do that. You said I was a piece of art. You decided to pay my heart. Driving the Nissan Leaf 2 on long journeys is great. It's got radar cruise control, which works generally pretty well. Once you set it, you will keep that speed and if the car in front of you slows down, it will slow down to match. Unfortunately, because I think it's got, got like a 45 degree cone uh, radar beam, it actually picks up on cars in adjacent lanes. So if they slow down and the lane in front of you is open, it will just continue to slow down to match those cars that are next to you. That you could say is actually a good driving habit and you should always match the traffic speed around you. But conversely, on a multi-lane freeway setting, it just seems like overkill. Speaking of overkill, I was doing a drop off with the kids at school and I was driving along just like this and it was just a single lane with parked cars to the left. And I was definitely in the clear, there was nothing in front of me, there was kids entering and exiting the cars and we're going slow. And for some reason, whatever it was, was it the camera or the radar? it thought we are going to have an imminent collision and the emergency brake kicked in. And my gosh, it shocked me because, well, there was nothing, nothing in front of us. Car behind me got a fright as well. Mm. It, I think that it, that just needs a little bit more tuning, both with the radar cruise control and the emergency braking. So like this car has a 40 kilowatt hour battery and will get you 270 kilometers on the WLTP cycle. In my testing I did on the weekend where I took a few long drives, I was only to get about 215 kilometers. Sure, that was actually mainly freeway highway driving and this car 
been on the WLTP cycle means that it'll do better if you actually use it around town. And the reason for that is that every time you accelerate, you've obviously had to use some energy to do so, but every time you slow down for a roundabout, traffic lights, whatever intersection you come to, as it regens, it's actually gonna put some juice back into your battery and, well, take you that little bit further. Whereas highway driving, that's basically gonna be just zapping that battery super fast and I got anxiety, I really did. I had to draft a truck, I had to turn the uh, climate control off. And I think that the takeaway message for this is gonna be if you frequently do long journeys, more than 200 kilometers, this might not be the car for you. Creature comforts in the Nissan Leaf are plentiful. There is a multitude of cup holders in this car. I'll put it on the screen now. The AV head unit is pretty good. Uh, it's got a pumping Bose stereo sound system of I think no less than nine speakers. And there's a subwoofer in the boot, which could be a problem for the people who want to carry a lot of stuff in that 400 plus litre boot. But nonetheless, the audio in this car is great. The AV head unit has a FM AM DAB radio, as well as Bluetooth, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. There's also climate control, single zone only, and it does a pretty good job. Down to 16 degrees, pretty rapid if you ask me, all the way up to, I don't know, 26 degrees or so. It's pretty good, which then begs the question, with that battery and no thermal management, why don't they just maybe put a slightly stronger heat pump on there, or air cool or whatever the technical term is, and well, give this battery the best chance it has of being preserved and protected because our Australian summers get very hot and reports of uh, rapid charging being throttled because your battery is too hot to accept that charge, that's, that needs to be addressed. My list of complaints about this car has been relatively small, except for, well, that big one, <coughs> battery. But one that I don't like is this, that indicator. What's with that indicator? It's like, it's like it's had way too many, way too many coffees and it's just mad. It's, it's not blinking like that a million times. No, it's not. So, oh, goodness sake, change that sound please, Nissan. The Nissan Leaf 2 is packed with safety features. You've got automatic emergency braking, electronic stability control, airbags throughout, rear cross detection alert, uh, driver, driver fatigue warning. It's a pretty good suite of features. The Nissan Leaf 2, who's it for? Well, if you live in the city or suburbia, this is definitely a car that you've got to put on your shopping list. If you need to do long drives, well, maybe look elsewhere, like either the Kona EV or the Tesla Model 3. At $54,000 on road, this car comes in $16,000 less than those two other cars. Doing journeys around home, school pickups, all the normal stuff that most people actually do in Australia, this car is more than capable. We want EV adoption to happen fast. And the way to do that is to get the right car for the right person for the right journey. But my experience of doing that freeway drive with having to drive behind a truck, limit my speed, turn off the air con or the heating rather, is not an experience that I would want on anyone. For EV adoption to happen, we need it to be a normal experience. And this car, it feels like a normal car. It drives great. The interior is well appointed. And it's something that when people get into it, they're like, oh, this is nice. This is an EV. And they're just surprised that the only difference here is that you're filling it with electrons and you've got an electric motor and can go crazy fast. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, give it a like, share it on your socials, and otherwise, be good, be green. <laughs>